Thank you, Professor Bengal. I'm sorry uh, we are uh, uh, short in time, so I will not take questions uh, at the moment. And if we have time uh, later, we'll uh, take question, uh, questions uh, at the end. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ran Trumer. He is a faculty member at uh, Tel Aviv University's uh, School of uh, Computer Science. His, uh, his research uh, area is cryptography and uh, information security, focusing on risks uh, pose, uh, posed by physical information leakage and untrusted platforms such as cloud computing. We think uh, cloud computing is trusted. Um, kind of, and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Trumer uh, is uh, heading the Lab Experimental Information uh, Security and is a co-director uh, of the Checkpoint uh, Institute of uh, Information Security. Please. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, to tell you about some of the research that I and uh, my colleagues are doing, uh, supported by these gracious sponsors, and uh, to appreciate with you some of the modern challenges of computing. And let me start with an easy question. Do you trust your computer as a network to operate correctly? Well. Those in this room probably don't. We know that all software is vulnerable. We know that there are many bugs, many exploits. But suppose that this problem was actually solved. Suppose that you've very carefully verified your software. Uh, you bought it from the right people. You're not using too low or high fr frequency or too high frequency or, any or anything of the sorts. Um, and yet, can you then trust your systems? Because there is a platform on which the software is running. And can you trust that very underlying platform? Well, let's uh, appreciate a few of the challenges that arise in practice when a computer is deployed in the field. So you have some computer, it can be big or small, it can have, have inputs and outputs, but eventually, nowadays, computers will have some secret embedded inside them. And those secrets, once they take physical form in a computer that is deployed and accessible by our adversaries, are vulnerable to um, leakage that violates their confidentiality. For example, maybe there's electromagnetic radiation going out from the computer that can be measured from, a, from afar. Maybe they can be opened up to pro and probed for the secrets. Uh, maybe the power consumption can be analyzed. Maybe optic em emanations from inside the chips can let an adversary uh, glean the secrets from inside. Um, and uh, in our lab, we found something very interesting, um, even Acoustic emanations, noise made by a computer, can be used to get the secret from, from within. Let me tell you a little bit about it. That's just one example out of many for the kind of attacks that are possible. Um, here's an example of uh, one of the setups we have, in, we have in our lab. On the right side, we have a target computer running standard cryptographic software of the kind that is used by, uh, by many millions of people worldwide to encrypt their emails and files, namely GNU-PG. And... Um, GNU-PG is running uh, very nicely implementing algorithms that are believed to be very secure mathematically, but they are implemented using electronics. And somewhere inside that laptop, there are capacitors and coils that are struggling to regulate the voltage of the CPU as it's executing the software. And those vibrate, affecting air molecules around them, but otherwise making noise, making sound. That we can pick up by a microphone, a very small capsule just at the very tip um, which is then amplified and filtered and conditioned and digitized uh, into uh, the computer on the left, which serves the attacker. And what that computer can observe is this, those secret keys from the GNU-PG instance running inside the laptop. Uh, pictorially, you can draw this this way, with the vertical axis being frequency and the horizontal axis, sorry, the vertical axis being time, the horizontal axis being frequency, and you can see that as you go down time, various things happen. Some of these things are decryption operations. And peeking inside, you can see all sort of strange artifacts. If you know how RSA works, you can see that these are the uh, uses of different secret components of the key. And from these, through a suitable attack, suitable algorithm, we can extract the full keys. And actually, uh, you can even uh, shift that information down into the audible range of the spectrum and hear key components using your ears. Um, if you don't like an attack uh, from one meter away, you can do it from 10 meters away using an inexpensive parabolic microphone. 
If you don't have a parabolic microphone, you can extract RSA keys using your cell phone, at least on some targets. So very cheap attacks uh, on very widely deployed software gets secret keys out, even though mathematically the software is fine. And what if you don't have any microphone at all? Well, we went on looking and we found some additional attacks, like um, observing electrical fluctuations on the ground, the earth ground of the computer. And uh, we realized that uh, we can put uh, a probe uh, attached to a computer and measure its electric potential and thereby uh, indirectly glean what the CPU is doing on what secret keys and extract those keys. Uh, you can uh, uh, stick a pen in a computer and measure its potential. You can hold a pen in your hand and measure its, uh, 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 its potential through your body. You can uh, use an Ethernet cable attached to a laptop and then put an alligator clip on the Ethernet switch to measure the electric potential on the shield of the cable. Or you can just grab the laptop with your hand and measure your own body potential and still get those same keys out. Well, um, those are troubling scenarios. These are the unexpected ways. Some of these uh, were uh, not reflected in long-standing uh, government standards for information leakage. Uh, some of these are just very easy to do in practice. And you may still say, well, actually, no one is anywhere near the computer on which I'm running the software. OK, uh, but I just heard that we are supposed to trust the cloud. And the thing is that the cloud is also running a, our software on physical hardware, and that uses physical CPUs, and those physical CPUs have all sort of effects inside them, all sort of contentions between different processes that are running. And for example, multiple virtual machines running on the same physical machine in the cloud will contend for resources locally. And we've shown that actually uh, once you put your virtual machine in the cloud, an attacker can uh, somehow manage to get his virtual machine into the same physical machine as you on the cloud by setting it up with just the right parameters after sufficiently understanding the structure of the cloud. And once the attacker is there, they can measure the contention with your virtual machine and deduce all sorts of um, uh, phenomena that are happening inside your VM, uh, like timing patterns, popularity of your websites, keystroke timing, up to and including in a recent walk, key extraction once again. So, obviously, confidentiality is a big issue in our platforms. And one may also wonder about integrity. And uh, let me just summarize this with a few alluring headlines, uh, saying that basically the U.S. military, even the U.S. military can't vet its hardware to a sufficient level to know that it's coming from legitimate suppliers and is correctly configured. And there are known cases where uh, counterfeit hardware, counterfeit chips made it into deployment in the field. And uh, when uh, DAPA went out uh, to build the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, they actually had that thought of, well, actually, who is building those chips that are running our airplane? And they started a, a comprehensive survey. They found 73 chips all of which were made by the cheapest bidder. And none of these was wholly manufactured in the USA. And uh, when some of uh, the, the United States potential adversaries have a, uh, a, a, a clear a view that uh, it's much cheaper to make uh, others aircraft carriers fail than it is to build aircraft carriers, uh, we have to wonder if the uh, U.S. military can't, uh, can't, certificate, can't certify and monitor its very own hardware, then who can? The traditional view of this was that we need, just need to be very careful about our suppliers, about verification, certification, validation. It's very expensive. Apparently, it's impractical, certainly for uh, small corporations, for consumers, for citizens. And I would like to advocate that there is an alternative that we should just accept what I've just shown as, re as the reality. Um, this is inevitable. Information will leak. Computation will be corrupted. Any trust we place in the platform will be violated. And what we have to do is build our systems in a paranoid way, where every component assumes that anything around it is corrupted and just has to fend for itself. And how can we indeed build such systems 
in a way that ensures integrity and confidentiality when, our, when our, the components and, and parties around us cannot be trusted. Now, for those who, uh, who recall, uh, I posed a similar challenge two years ago um, at uh, the International Cyber Conference. And I'm happy to say that significant progress has been made since on realizing this vision. Uh, this took uh, many forms using uh, very advanced cryptographic tools. And um, I even recognize uh, several people in this audience who are at the forefront of this research. I will not be able to survey all of it. I will just yet again give a single glimpse, a single shard of the progress on one aspect of the problem. And that is dealing with integrity of computation through cryptographic proofs, what we call technically succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge, SNARKs for short. And the idea is the following. We have some device, some local device, which we control, so we trust, or at least trust more than others. And some of you would like to use an external resource out there. Think about it as a cloud service we do not fully trust. Think about it as some kind of party that you are communicating with and you do not fully trust. And yet you would like it to perform some computation on your behalf. Now, if this was just storing something on your behalf, it would be easy. You would use a digital signature. But digital signatures don't let you do a computation. We would like, we want more. We want to be able to send some program off to that external server, the untrusted server, and have the server evaluate that program, come up with the result, and accompany that with a proof that can be easy, easily verified. It's a synced proof that can be checked in a fast way for any computation. If you could do that, then you could remove the trust that you place in the cloud or the, uh, the external party and just verify that you operated correctly. Amazingly, this is possible and actually implemented. Um, you can, we've demonstrated, for example, that you can take a C program, compile it using a special compiler that generates an executable that doesn't just run the program and produce the output, but also produces that succinct proof. We ran that, on the, that program on the cloud. The, the cloud came back to us with an answer and a small QR code containing a proof of that answer that we could verify on a cell phone. So that suddenly this asymmetry between the, the small trusted device and the powerful cloud becomes benign and, easily, and the trust uh, gap is easily, is easily solved. We can generalize this further to networks, to whole networks that con contain uh, complicated computation that could, f uh, could uh, be struggling to maintain some uh, complex invariants, like maybe a huge data center containing some pro uh, sensitive network and then a classified network. They should be kept separate. How do you do that? Traditionally, it's very expensive. You have to be very careful about who goes there and what hardware goes in and how it's wired and uh, they have armed guards and spot checks and many expensive mechanisms, and yet in practice, as we know, this fails once some USB key or a rogue person comes in. But imagine if we could have a guard on the exit from the data center checking every f figurative network packet coming out and making sure that it's accompanied by a proof attest attesting that that complicated past computation fulfilled the requisite invariance. Slightly more formally, you have a network of nodes performing some computation. Uh, you, will, you want to perform some invariant. You enforce it by to attaching to every piece of data a corresponding proof. And you maintain the property that every piece of data throughout the computation has a proof that it was computed correctly. And moreover, it relied on information from the past itself computed correctly. We call this approach proof carrying data, as uh, the name should be obvious. And, um, it turns out to be very powerful for expressing all sorts of properties in all sorts of systems. Let me just throw a few buzzwords at you for some of the applications that we already or soon will be pursuing. One of them is in the realm of uh, Bitcoin. We have a working system based on, this, on these prototypes and these implementations. It improves the privacy of Bitcoin. In a nutshell, in Bitcoin, there's a the blockchain that tells everyone about every transaction that has ever happened. So anyone can know who you paid, how much, and when. It's like posting all of your credit card statements online. Um, well, we can, using uh, snark proofs, basically hide all of that information so an outsider cannot learn anything, and yet the invariants that you care about in a currency are still preserved. 
We can use this for authenticating images. We can use this for addressing the uh, uh, supply chain uh, uh, challenge, at least in some scenarios, uh, improve data leak prevention, and um, numerous other applications. And actually, the greatest challenge, I think, is finding additional applications where these kind of tools, these kinds of formalisms can be of help. In recent years, there's been tremendous progress in implementing this system. This is just one slice uh, in a very large body of work, and I won't have time to go into the, the features, but just looking at the colors and check marks, you can see that we've gradually achieving everything that we could hope for. Uh, and right now, the biggest barrier is that of performance, because these systems still have a significant overhead. And a lot of this work is done in a collaboration with my colleagues at uh, Technion and uh, MIT under the uh, Skipper Lab, Virtual Research Lab. And if you're interested, you're encouraged to go there and learn more about our systems and our vision. To summarize, we don't trust the platforms, but actually we don't have to, because computing without trust is possible. SNARKs, proof-carrying data that I've mentioned, other things that I did not, like uh, multi-party computation, fully homomorphic encryption, leakage resilience, are all powerful emerging tools from the cryptographic community that deal with these challenges and uh, uh, move the, the brunt of the work from the engineers to the cryptographers that, uh, that, build the, that uh, secure the, the mathematics of the system. Um, many of these transformations are uh, automagical. You express your, what you want, for example, you write a C program, you compile it, and it magically becomes secure. It's amazing, but it actually works and in a well-defined way. There are uh, mathematical properties that we can specify that, uh, as the security um, uh, uh, guarantees. We can show that they actually hold under well-specified conditions. And um, um, we actually have implementations that demonstrate the practicality of this. So we believe that these are very strong candidates for augmenting, in some cases, uh, replacing the traditional assurance mechanisms. The greatest challenge, as I said, is that of uh, finding applications where this can make a real-world impact and encourage the people in this audience who are facing challenges to look at this, uh, these techniques, to talk to me and the others that are working on them, and to see whether we can help you. Thank you very much.